Love is Blind, The Reunion, Season 6. In this video, I want to ask all the burning questions that weren't asked in the reunion. I'm prepared to be the host. I'm gonna take over Vanessa's spot. But what did you think of this new format? Do you like that the previous couples were there? Did you like that it was live? So much to get into, let's dive in. Welcome to Reality TV Therapy with me, Dr. Diane. Welcome back, I'm Dr. Diane Strakowski, licensed psychologist and reality TV therapy analyst. I start my videos with a little bit of life housekeeping. And I wanna say that I was out of town, so this video is just a couple days late. I was out skiing, but boy, did I watch it. I watched it a couple times. And as a therapist, I want to bring it back to substance. I wanna talk about families, to talk about the lessons that we can learn in love, because that's why I follow these shows. Why I follow reality TV is that in no other circumstance would you ever get feedback watching yourself back. And the reunions, why do I love reunions? Sure, I wanna know how the couples are doing, but the reunions, as I see it, are also an opportunity for redemption, for ways to then settle, take all the information in, to say, oh my gosh, watching this back, I am so sorry this is what was happening for me. Not a way to rehash or reiterate what you did say or didn't say, but to say this is what I've learned since then. Because we know with Netflix there is a long delay in taping and then us actually watching it on the show. But I love reunions where the hosts are holding people accountable. Let me start with the positives. First off, Nick and Vanessa did better in this reunion than they had in other ones. I kind of feel like there was a gun to their head though, saying do better now or otherwise we're gonna replace you with different hosts. And they delivered, they did. They did better than they had in other episodes. But here's the thing, Nick and Vanessa are not trained interviewers. They're entertainers. The good thing is that we didn't have to hear all about their previous relationships. We didn't have to hear them talk about babies that much. So they did the best that they could. And I do think that they held some people accountable. So then they took this gun and looked at the other people like Trevor and Sarah Ann and said, no, 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 we won't have any of this. This is the integrity of the show. We are called love. Love is blind. So I did like that because the message is you influencers who are coming on for clout, find a different show. So that part I was okay with. I thought it was actually fair. And I know that I would like to see people who are legitimately there for the real reasons or what in Bachelor Nation we call the right reasons. And Nick was very clear to say that, you know, we want to see the results. We don't want people coming here for fame. It's just wrong to have ulterior motives. The one thing they did really want to reiterate is that the process, the experiment does work. And I guess it does. If nine out of the 11 couples are still together, those are okay odds. Now, one could say that not that many years have passed, but we did have some of the OGs there. Let's talk about that. They refer to them as the OGs, but as I recall, the real OGs, right, are Lauren and Cameron and Amber and Burnett. They were the OGs from season one, and it was such a shame we didn't have them on stage. I've heard that Lauren and Cameron had something else, but who knows? Anyway, for me, that was a bit of a miss. But I wanna talk about the bigger misses. As a therapist watching this, I've seen all of the commentary, or a lot of it, I should say, and why aren't we talking more about Chelsea and Jimmy? Okay, that's like the biggest miss. The biggest controversial couple with all the anxiety and all the drama, we don't really get much of an update on how they are because it sounds like they tried to date each other a couple times. We didn't really go into that much. But if this were me and I'm Vanessa, I'm gonna put this little guy away. If I'm Vanessa, I'm going to speak to Chelsea and say, Chelsea, you got a lot of flack and hate for being very emotional. Jimmy called you clingy. Watching yourself back, what was the hardest moment? Do you think that Jimmy only saying he loves you but not saying more about why, did that make you more anxious? Chelsea, we never got to meet your family, only your sister at the dress fitting and your mom FaceTimed. 
what have you learned from your family? What can you tell us about your own relationships as it pertains to your parents? Give us some more context, Chelsea. Chelsea, you mentioned that you regretted many times that you shouldn't have shared about Jimmy and his last friend. But are there other things you think that you would have done differently? And Chelsea, if you went to the altar, would you have said yes? Because at some point in that conversation, it looked like you were ambivalent too. Chelsea, you mentioned publicly that you're in therapy. If you don't mind sharing, what lessons have you learned about yourself? Do you have any advice for people who can relate to you, Chelsea? Now, of course, in the couple, I have to hold both of them accountable. That's who I am. I'm the couple's therapist. People come to me and I'm looking at both people and their contributions. So if I was talking to Jimmy, I would say, Jimmy, is there any scenario where you would have said yes to Chelsea? Imagine that fight didn't happen. She didn't disclose that information. Would you have said yes to her? Jimmy, how much did hearing that Chelsea looked like Megan Fox, did that convince you to choose her over Jessica? Jimmy, you called Chelsea clingy. Do you regret that? Do you want to tell people more about what that meant? Jimmy, when Chelsea was drunk that night, did you ever think that you could stop the conversation to protect her? Chelsea said in the pods that you were more of a homebody, but in reality, you go out a lot. Which is it? And finally, Jimmy, your dad and mom, um, there was some light kind of banter between them. Can you give us a little bit more context about that? Jimmy, you seemed a bit reserved. I wonder if it's hard for you to be vulnerable. Do you ever tell your partner that anything beyond I love you? Do you elaborate more? What have you learned about yourself? So moving along, let's talk about the love triangle. Sarah Ann, Jeremy, Laura, because all along, I have said that I thought this really went to Jeremy's head. And unfortunately, in many ways, he's the villain of the season. And by virtue of association, so is Sarah Ann. The reunion was tough to watch, right? Jeremy comes out, people are making fun of him in the Hawaiian shirt that felt a little passive aggressive. Sarah Ann looks like she's from the 90s, right, with the glitter and the hair, and they look like they're going to prom. But ultimately, I think Jeremy, you know, people are saying, is he a narcissist? Is he, um, is he an avoidant? I think he's a deeply insecure person. I just think he lacks insight into himself. But I, too, think that he struggles with being vulnerable. So if I was talking to Jeremy, I would say, Jeremy, you looked really uncomfortable in the pods. I went back and I looked at those tapes. And while we know our sofas are not terribly comfortable, people usually choose to sit in front of them to talk to their partner, but you chose to sit behind them. To me, it looks like you're hiding in some ways, like there's a wall. How do you respond to that? You yourself, after the whole bean dip gate, said to Laura that you struggle with opening up and communication. And oftentimes you were kind of surprised when things flipped, that you could be better at communication. What are you doing to work on your communication now? Is that something that's been an issue for you? Jeremy, looking back at that interaction between Laura and Sarah Ann, Laura was really kind of forewarning her that you say one thing, but you do another. Fill us in. Is that a pattern in this current relationship? Jeremy, it appeared really hard for you to be vulnerable. And as a result, you came across dismissive. With everything that you've now observed about yourself, what have you learned? Moving forward, what are you going to be doing differently? And Sarah Ann, I'm not here to tell you how to feel. Um, you were devastated when things didn't work out with Jeremy, so much so that it propelled you to DM Jeremy. But did you really think through how others might see that, and in particular, Laura? Sarah Ann, what do you want people to know about you? All right, 
and I've got to hold every part of the triangle accountable. Laura, certainly she was duped by Jeremy and we could feel bad for Laura. But I would say, Laura, you know, we did see you, you mentioned getting the ick a few times early on with Jeremy. You even joked about the ick with your family. Would you have said yes if you got to the altar with Jeremy because we never got to see that? Laura, are you usually this assertive in relationships because people gave you some flack for that? Do you have any regrets? And what have you learned about yourself, Laura? Moving on to Clay NAD. One of the biggest questions I've heard is some speculation that Clay could have said no to AD sooner. Like the question for all of us is why did he bring AD to the altar? He could have done like Jimmy. He could have broken up with AD sooner. Now, the speculation, again, this is rumor. I don't know if this is true, that AD, as we know, may be struggling financially. Supposedly, Clay said that he stayed for her because couples, as they do, they get a little bit more money the longer they stay. I don't know, again, if this is true or not because AD actually acted very surprised. And the interesting thing is, according to the production, that if you leave early, you could also be fined. But then, like, how did Jimmy get out of the contract? Well, supposedly you need permission from the producers. So I don't really know where that lands. Why does that matter? Well, I think personally, there's just so much content there. Okay, it happened as it happened. What I would say to Clay, I would say, Clay, we saw you struggling early on. You talked a lot about your fears of cheating. Do you think that cheating is a genetic thing? Is it a nature nurture thing? Please tell us more. And do you think that because your dad was a cheater that that's your destiny? Clay, you've mentioned that you are in therapy, even a couple therapists. Do you have any insights that you can share with us and AD? Clay, let's talk a little bit about your dad. We know that he got a tough edit too, but my theory is that you were afraid of confronting him. You said the day of your wedding, he gave you a little pep talk that he was like pouring into you. At the same time, we didn't see a lot of vulnerability. Are you worried that your relationship is fragile, that if you confronted your dad, that he might leave permanently? What we saw as the audience it was so important, that conversation between your mom and dad about breaking intergenerational patterns. While your father was most likely better than your grandfather, you can also understand, I'm sure, that other people are saying that a good father doesn't take his son to his cheating rendezvous. If your dad hasn't apologized, would you consider doing family therapy with him? Maybe your dad also needs some help coming out and communicating. Your mom had some great things to say to that. Tell us more. All right, I don't know what more I would say to Clay because I actually really liked Clay and thought that he was showing the most growth out of other people. I don't know if what he was saying is the truth or not. Um, and AD wasn't really buying it. All of her eye rolling was like, mm, no, I'm not having it. But I do think that regardless, uh, Clay is 30 years old and this growth is going to be important for him. And I hope he really doesn't see that cheating is... Um, a foregone conclusion, that he really holds himself accountable, finds somebody that he can really work with, and also is an anchor for them. Because so often what was frustrating is he kept talking about what AD did for him, and I didn't hear like what he does for her, just that he was going to disappoint her. So that would be the work that I would really encourage Clay to continue. Now, you see, I've got my red flag here, and that's for AD. When AD came, and I would say to her, of course, you were the meme for red flags, painting your nails red to match. Tell us more about that. Are you thinking about relationships differently? And AD, speaking about Matthew and him making you chicken and rice, do you think that if you had not found out about him saying the same thing to Amber than with you, that you might have left with Matthew. Okay, and if you didn't then, do you think that maybe 
the sadness that you carried from Matthew, because that's what we saw, propelled you to be more likely to say yes to Clay. On your wedding day, you captured America's heart. Your statement about not being good enough, so many people could relate, feeling that you weren't being chosen. But despite the red flags, you said yes. Do you think, what do you think influenced your decision to move forward with Clay, despite the fact that you knew that something was wrong? And finally, AD, Clay brought up some issues sort of after that I'm sure you've seen, talking about your finances, and that was a concern of his. Where are you now? And what have you learned in this experiment? Let's switch topics to something more positive. Our only couple, Johnny and Amy. People are saying that this couple is boring. I, I don't think they're boring at all. I think they are in love. They're sweet. Um, yeah, okay, those, those Christmas photos were kind of cringy. But let's look at all the positive ones. I thought it was funny, right, that the families are coming together, uh, making fun, going to JCPenney's. I loved, like, the Paris pictures. Like, you knew that this couple had a wonderful wedding, came together, that this was an opportunity of a lifetime. Yeah, we can joke around about Johnny and Amy and ask Johnny how he didn't know about condoms, but we're not going to get too far about that. I think, ultimately, I loved this couple. So what I would ask people, to both Johnny and to Amy, because Amy, it seemed like she kept saying Johnny was not her typical type. So what advice, Amy, would you have for people who are struggling in their singleness? Would you advise people to try something like Love is Blind to get out of their comfort zone? All right, let's move on to Trevor. What do I say to Trevor? All right, I'm the host. Nick's already come for Trevor saying that, you know, the integrity of the show. What I would say is, Trevor, you said that your previous relationship was toxic. But besides that, what I think so many people are curious about, and I know you're going to get hate for this, but... You're the kind of man who is in a relationship. You're acting as if a boyfriend. You're saying, I love you. I want to marry you. But now here, in real life, you're saying that you weren't all that. Like, what is behind your fear of commitment? You came on the show, Trevor, talking about the notebook and butterflies. Do you feel that people in the real world don't understand you? What do you want them to know about you? And if you wanted someone different than your pumpkin, Trevor, why not break up with her first? Trevor, please tell us if you're in a better place now and what you've learned from the experiment. What to say about Brittany and Kenneth. I don't have a little stuffed dolphin. But Brittany really defended Kenneth on social media, saying that he wasn't on the phone as much as we showed. He did say that he's a principal. He had a lot of backlog. And they both really let us know that they were very respectful to one another. But I would say, Kenneth, question for you. We did see that pivotal conversation with A.D. and Clay. And it looked like you, at that moment then, you were had your own sadness that you saw them as a black power couple and that wasn't what you had. And even in the pods, though, you know, Brittany asked you about your racial background. She was clear about how you identified, and yet you thought that she was a Caucasian. You even said she thought you thought she was blonde. Did somehow the race difference after the fact surprise you? Because that's what it looked like to us. Please tell us more. Now, Brittany, you were also America's sweetheart, such a loving partner to Kenneth, despite the fact that we saw how heart breaking this was for you not to get the affection and then to have that probably what was a long breakup. The one thing that people want to know though, Brittany, is that you oftentimes referred to as how you identify, that you identified as a white woman. Tell us more about the background of that statement. Jessica, we just showed everyone the receipts that Jimmy said that you left after 10 minutes when really it was more what you said over two hours. But we want to hold everyone accountable. What was behind your decision to not tell Jimmy earlier that you had a daughter? Was there something different about Jimmy because you did tell other people early on that you were a mom? 
And finally, we'd have to ask, at the barbecue, when you first met Jimmy and you did sort of the church hug, I got the feeling that you weren't totally into Jimmy. You liked his voice, but something switched for you. If he did say yes to you, do you think you would have said yes at the altar? Jessica, what have you learned about yourself in this experience? So that's pretty much what I would summarize. Did that cover all your questions? Do you have more burning questions that I didn't get to? Let me summarize what we can learn from this season. I have been saying all along, you know, I would love if there was a therapist on site to sort of help them. Some people are saying, well, if you have to go to the couples therapy that early on, what's the point? But I really think that if you're not going to bring therapists, because that would be like married at first sight, that what would be really powerful is to have previous couples. Not that we need them to ask the, you know, the followers questions. When Brett and Tiffany modeled for Clay, for instance, I thought that was brilliant because Clay could say to Brett, wow, I really admire you. And then Brett could say, you know, I struggled too. I struggled with the same things that you were thinking of. How could I be a better person? But I leaned into it. And I just really loved that moment. I thought that was really one of the best moments in terms of the reunion. The two men kind of joining together, I thought that was absolutely lovely. And we also have to talk about the Love is Blind babies because I'm sure that Vanessa would be so happy about that. But congratulations to Alexa and Brennan and Zach and Bliss. And can we also talk about Gigi? Because if you recall, uh, Gigi was from episode one and things didn't work out with her and her guy, but now Gigi is pregnant with Blake Hortzman. Blake is from The Bachelor. He was from the episode where he was with Becca Kufrin. So I love that crossover, but we didn't get to hear that introduction. And good for Izzy that he's fixed his credit and that Micah and Jess are going to be on perfect match. So much to get into, so much to look forward to for the next season. But overall, I really enjoyed season six more than I thought. I was ready to give up after season five. I was like, okay, I'm done. But it renewed my hope. Things can work out. Do your work. Focus on yourself. Be the best partner that you can. And make sure to stay tuned because I'm going to have Relationship Rx videos on Sunday in between now and the next time that a season pops up. But thank you so much for staying till the end. I hope you got something out of this reunion. I just want to ask the questions that we didn't get to hear. And until next time, love is blind.